I'd like to introduce Luke Williams. He's, he's a master's student at Imperial College in London, and he's been working with David Nutt and Robin Carhart-Harris and others on uh, work with psychedelics and uh, functional connectivity analyses in, uh, in the brain. And so today he'll be talking about the effects of psilocybin and MDMA on resting state hippocampal functional connectivity. So please help me welcome Luke. Uh, right, well, thanks everybody, and a uh, big thank you to MAPS for having me here. Um, uh, as I just said, my talk is going to be about uh, resting state hippocampal functional connectivity under psilocybin and MDMA. Uh, this talk's going to be in, in four parts, essentially. Uh, firstly, a bit of background on what functional connectivity and resting straight uh, intrinsic networks are, the results we've got from the psilocybin study, the results we've got from the MDMA study, and finally a bit of discussion about what it might all mean. So first off, a bit of background on uh, what functional connectivity is. So functional connectivity is a type of analysis performed using fMRI uh, comparing correlations in uh, fluctuating activity in different brain regions. Uh, this is done by um, measuring a time series of fluctuating activity over a particular, um, in a particular region of interest over time and compared to other brain regions. Regions which show similar time courses of activity are said to be positively coupled uh, or functionally connected, uh, whereas regions with antiphase time series are said to be negatively coupled. So we'll see an example of this here. So here we have two regions, uh, the red and the yellow lines, which are positively coupled. You can see that over time here on the x-axis, and this here is the percentage of bold change. The bold is the signal in fMRI, it's an indirect measure of, um, of neuronal activity. Um, it measures the change in oxygenation of the blood. But you can see that these two regions here are pretty close over this time period. So you'd say that those two are pretty positively coupled together. Uh, in this bottom diagram, we can see there's another line, this uh, blue time series, which is negatively coupled. You can see uh, it's basically antiphase in the opposite direction, whenever the red and the yellow lines are up, it's down, and vice versa. So um, that region, we would say, is, is negatively coupled to the other two. Using this uh, technique of functional connectivity, it's possible to investigate resting state networks in the brain. And this slide is just an example of two resting state networks. I want to, um, so when I say resting state, that means that the subjects are in the scanner, eyes closed, not told to do anything particular. They can daydream or think about whatever they like. Um, and this is an example of two different networks. There are, there are many more networks that you can determine by resting state functional connectivity, including attentional networks, visual networks. And I'm not going to go into those here because they're not particularly relevant. But here you can see two networks. This one in the yellow and red is what's known as a task positive network and tends to be activated in a wide variety of tasks. Um, and all the regions in that network are positively correlated together. So when they see increased activation in, say, here, you also see increased activation here. So they'll go up and down together. The other, the green and the blue, um, is another network which is called the default mode network. And you've probably heard Amanda talk about this this morning, and various other people have talked about it. It's quite a big deal for us in psychedelics research at the moment. Um, and again, the areas in the default mode network are positively correlated together. And when the default mode network is up, the task positive network is down and vice versa. So in a task in a scanner, um, you'd see the task positive network going up. And then when you told people to rest, you'd see the default mode network going up and the task positive network going down. So. Why is a default mode network? As I said, it's uh, the network most active when subjects are left to rest, undisturbed, eyes closed, daydreaming, and often associated with um, sort of free association or open modes of thinking. It was originally determined by PET studies that showed uh, deactivations across a wide range of tasks, and this is the PET um, meta-analysis from Buckner and all. So, the important thing to take away from this 
replicated by the functional connectivity I've already talked about. Uh, and the main regions that are involved in this are, so this is, a, this is the left hemisphere of the brain, this is the uh, lateral surface, the outside, and this is the medial surface, so inside the hemisphere. Um, and the, the three main regions which tend to be, uh, which are correlated across lots of different studies, are the uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex here, the posterior cingulate cortex here, and the inferior lateral parietal cortices on, on both sides of the brain here. Now, what has this got to do with psychedelics? Um, this is the study that Robin Carhart Harris, my supervisor, published uh, last year, um, which is looking at uh, the psilocybin study, looking at functional connectivity in one particular region of the brain, which is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which we can see here as this red blob. Now, this top image is the baseline. So this is placebo when before any drugs been given, and you can see that the red area is the, the bits in orange and red around it are those ones that it's positively coupled to, and the blue bits are those that it's negatively coupled to. So you can see here in orange the areas of the default mode network, and in blue you see areas that belong to attentional task positive networks. So this region, when activity goes up in it, activity goes up in this re these regions here, and when activity goes down, then activity goes down in these regions here, and vice versa in the blue regions. Now the two bottom images are subjects under psilocybin, and it's really important here to understand that these images are about changes in connectivity. So although we're seeing like a blue bit here, that doesn't mean that these two are now negatively correlated and are in complete opposition. It just means that there's a decrease in any positive correlation there was before, um, and vice versa with these red bits. There's an increase. Uh, sorry, there's a um, there's a decrease in the decrease, basically. So there's an increase of in connectivity to these bits, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're down positively coupled. They just could be less negatively coupled. So anyway, that's what's been done before. And my work has been uh, looking at a different region of the brain, the hippocampus. I'm sure plenty of you know the hippocampus is very important in memory, uh, spatial memory, episodic memory, memories about the self and also navigation. In, there's been a lot of work in, in, in rats looking at place cells and grid cells, which are cells that respond specifically to one particular place or uh, a grid of places. Um, not everyone would agree that the hippocampus is an intrinsic part of the default mode network, but there is growing evidence that, um, that it is, and there's a lot of work coming out now to show positive correlations between activity. And here's a bit of... Uh, um, and uh, from, I think this is a, it's not a meta-analysis, but it's, it's four different studies um, showing connectivity between the hippocampus and other regions of the brain. And again, you can see this medial PCC region, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and uh, these the lateral parietal regions, so almost exactly the same areas. Right, so now on to what I've actually been doing. That's the sort of neuroscience background for you. Psilocybin study, there's a picture of psilocybin. I'm sure we all know what that is, um, but it's the phosphate ester of 4-hydroxy-DMT. And in this study, we had 15 healthy volunteers which were scanned on two occasions, once receiving saline and once receiving IV infusion of 2 milligrams psilocybin halfway through a 12-minute scan. Um, 2 milligrams IV psilocybin probably doesn't sound like a lot, but on our pilot studies, um, we showed that people rated it pretty similar to a 15 milligram oral dose. So that's like a moderate dose of psilocybin. Uh, some people had quite intense experiences in the scanner, you know, proper uh, visual experiences and memory regression, changes in their perception of time, self, space. So it's, it's definitely a, a, psych a very psychedelic dose. Um, so once they'd been in the scanner and we'd scanned them um, before and after psilocybin and, and also did a placebo one, we created a mask um, which is the region of interest, composed of bilateral hippocampi and the parahippocampal gyri, um, which is based just on an anatomical atlas. So no kind of, um, we didn't take anything from the experiments to generate that mask. It's based on sort of prior work. And um, the reason we did both bilateral hippocampi and parahippocampal gyri is because of work showing the two are strongly connected and involved 
together and communicating with the rest of the brain. And these are the results. So in yellow, you can see the mask. That's the region that we're looking at, the, the, the hippocampus on either side of the brain. And in red and blue, you can see the increases and decreases. So in red, we see an increase in connectivity to the right insula, which is, which is kind of interesting. But the, the, the really interesting stuff here is that we see these really clear decreases in connectivity in regions of the default mode network again. So here, prefrontal cortex, PCC, and these lateral parietal regions. And this was even stronger than the, the previous work done using the ventromedial prefrontal cortex as a seed region. So strong decreases, statistically significant decreases in connections between the hippocampus and the default mode network. And this is the MDMA study. Again, you all know what MDMA is. And in this study, we had 25 subjects scanned on two occasions, one placebo and one with an oral dose of 100 milligrams MDMA hydrochloride. Uh, in this experiment, we did two scans each time, so 60 minutes after dose and 120 minutes after dose, and those two scans were averaged together. And we used the same hippocampal mask I haven't put the mask on this image because I'm sorry this isn't quite as nice an image as the uh, psilocybin, but that requires a bit of fancy software that I don't actually have on my computer. So I have to use these rather more boring and, and slightly more grainy images. Um, so the mask isn't shown, but it's exactly the same mask used in both studies. And we can, what we can see here is increases in yellow and decreases in blue. And you can see it's really quite different to psilocybin. Um, we're still getting a decrease to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex here. We're not seeing any change in the PCC, and we're not seeing any change in these lateral parietal regions. Instead, we're seeing a bit of decrease on the left temporal pole and also the right frontal pole, and also these pretty interesting big increases in the midbrain and the pons, and also some stuff in the right hippocampus and amygdala and some bits in sensory motor cortices up here. So essentially, we're seeing a pretty different pattern of effects. Um, and I'm going to sort of discuss about the difference between those two in a second. But it's, it's, I, th I think you'll agree it's pretty clear that there's strong differences between the two. So what does this all mean? Firstly, there's a clear difference in changes in connectivity between MDMA and psilocybin. So if you like, that's a kind of biological signature of these two drugs' effects. On the psilocybin, these changes are mostly confined to the default mode network and primarily decreases. In MDMA, we've seen a much broader series of increases and decreases in frontal and, and limbic areas. And these results probably reflect the two different mechanisms of action. So we know that psilocybin is mainly a 5-HT2A agonist, although it has other 5-HT1A um, agonists and properties as well. And we know that MDMA is primarily a serotonin releaser, but also has effects on noradrenaline and dopamine and possibly acetylcholine as well. So these kind of broad effects we're seeing with MDMA in the, in the midbrain and, and a variety of, sort of spread out areas are quite different to the ones we're seeing in psilocybin. And we know that the areas that psilocybin is affecting, the, the, the default mode network is quite rich in 5-HT2A uh, uh, receptors. Um, now, I'm not going to talk too much more about the MDMA study because I don't really feel confident in saying what that means about MDMA. The, the results are too vague, if you like. They point to too many different areas of the brain that we wouldn't put together as a coherent network, whereas with psilocybin, we're seeing uh, effects that apply to a well understood and pretty well studied network now. So I'm not going to say any more about the MDMA except that it's clearly different to the psilocybin. But what I'm going to talk a little bit about is about the hippocampus, the default mode network, and this idea of scene construction. So uh, in 2007, uh, these two uh, people here, well, uh, one chap and one lady, um, Hassabis and Maguire published this paper uh, called um, about scene construction. Uh, Hasselbis is actually a really interesting guy because he was a, a chess prodigy at the age of 13 and then went into designing computer games for 
a portion of his adult life before returning and studying cognitive neuroscience, so he's a pretty remarkable character. But they've come up with this idea of scene construction, which is, at first, some people were a bit suspicious of it, and, but they've been, it's been more reproduced. There's been lots of results kind of supporting it now, so it's kind of gaining favor. And here's a quote from their paper. We define scene construction as a process of mentally generating and maintaining a complex and coherent scene or event. So what they argue in their paper is that scene construction is a common process underlying a variety of different mental states. Uh, episodic memory recall, future imagination of events, as well as navigation and imagination of totally fictitious scenes. And it involves a network including both the hippocampus and the default mode. In fact, they want to say that it's this one thing that is a, is a whole network that underlies a variety of different cognitive processes. So this is a table from their paper uh, listing along the top here a um, processes and down the side uh, cognitive functions. So we see this scene construction here, other things, subjective time, self, autonoetic consciousness, which is being able to place yourself in a time stream, narrative, familiarity, visual imagery, planning, task monitoring. And then down here we see episodic memory recall, episodic future thinking, navigation, imagination, default network, by that they mean this kind of daydreaming, free thinking, not particularly working on any task, uh, replay, vivid dreaming, and theory of mind. And they've marked whether these processes are involved in these uh, cognitive states. And so the, scene construct the important thing to take away from this is that scene construction is involved in almost all of them, and well, that's what they propose anyway. And in their paper, they also have a brain image, and surprisingly enough, this is a glass brain, so it's kind of looking all the way through the brain. As you imagine the brain's made out of glass and all the activities being shown. And again, we're seeing these prefrontal regions, these medial PCC regions, and then the hippocampus down here, all showing uh, concurrent activation together. So what we'd like to propose, essentially, is that psilocybin's mechanism of action it's one of disrupting this process of scene construction by weakening the coherence of the network that supports it. And that doesn't mean that you're not able to construct scenes at all. What it means is that different elements of that network probably don't talk together so well and introduce chaotic elements or uh, things that, should, that wouldn't, under normal experience, be there. So this weakening coherence of the network doesn't mean there's no, no scene at all. It just it changes, and we think that underlies disruptions to perception, you know, to your sense of time, space, uh, sense of self, which you get these fairly profound changes with, with psilocybin. And I think it's fair to say that you don't get those with MDMA. Some people might argue against that, um, but I think that they're much more profound with psilocybin and these kind of dosages. And, and that's about it, really. Um, I'd just like to thank my uh, collaborators and colleagues especially Robin, my supervisor, and David, who's the head of the department. Um, this work was uh, part of the Beckley Foundation Imperial College Psychedelic Research Program, and it's also um, given some financial support by both MAPS and the Hefter Institute, so I'd like to thank them as well. And that's all. Put it time for some questions. Okay, we have some time for questions, but I'm going to ask um, the first question. So have you looked at any uh, subjective correlates of the functional connectivity changes, either with psilocybin or MDMA, that might help kind of tease apart what parts of the phenomenology are mapping onto the brain? We did actually, um, there is, a, we, there is a, we did look at the correlation between changes in functional connectivity in the hippocampus and the kind of general uh, level of subject rate intoxication on, on psilocybin. Um, and there was a trend level. There wasn't anything that was really, it was almost statistically significant, but not quite. So I haven't included those there, but it's quite a small study with 15 people. And I think further studies with larger groups would probably bring out those changes more. Um, I think Robin is gonna talk more about this on Sunday with the MEG data, which shows sort of stronger um, correlations with subjective effects. But yeah, I haven't, I didn't want to put them in because I'm not totally sure about it here.
I was just wondering when uh, you're measuring functional connectivity, if you incorporate phase shifts into that, are they, uh, are the signals increasing and decreasing at the same times, or are they generally shifted from each other? I mean, the um, depending on the how positively correlated and how negatively correlated they are, then that's a sort of measure of phase. So when they're complete, when there's a strong negative change, it means they're moving out of phase together. So, but with these sort of effects, we're seeing not subtle changes, like significant changes, but they're not. So yeah, they are moving in and out of phase. If you're seeing like total, really strong connectivity, then you'd, they'd be totally in phase. But as it drops, then they're moving slightly out of phase. subjective reports of people who undergo a psilocybin experiences of an enhanced sort of scene with more information than normally get but does this seem to contradict that or am i interpreting it incorrectly well n no not really because the um the system like the default mode network system and the scene construction network is a kind of sort of top down controlling network so there's an idea that as the network loses coherence, it stops being able to control information flow between different brain regions. So although it appears that things are decreasing activity, it actually allows more information to come through into your consciousness. And that's, that's the general idea that we're proposing. It's the sort of controlling part and then the, the, that's you know, controlling the amount of information that flows into your consciousness. That's the general idea. Just a quick question. So you saw that there are changes in the default mode network, functional connectivity with psilocybin, um, specifically with functional connectivity of the insula. And I was wondering, there are four, I believe, heteromodal resting state networks, um, including the salience network. So I was wondering if you, know, you would have predicted the change in functional connectivity with the insula and what, why you think that, that might have, that's well, what you saw. Well, um, another sort of general theory that we have is that um, when the, we're seeing decreases in the default mode network, you see um, on the other side increases to salience attention networks. So it's like the two networks that are quite separate normally become sort of a bit blended together. So you're seeing a kind of, instead of there being two really clear, here's a task positive network with attention and here's a clear default mode network, the two are becoming more like each other and that's part of, that's part of the experience. Uh, with respect to your protocol, was it a parallel process? Were they essentially equivalent with what you did uh, outside of the difference in dosages and, of course, the molecules? Uh, what was your protocol in terms of, besides the brain imaging, how much time did you give them? And were they wearing headphones? Were they wearing a well, mask? Were they doing the standard things that yeah, they were consider in Methow? Yeah, the, I mean, this, these results from the resting state were part of a sort of much larger protocol. So the subjects were doing some tests in the scanner and outside the scanner as well. But at points we would say, just rest with your eyes closed for six minutes and we do the resting state scans. But there were a variety of memory tasks that they did under both conditions, which are quite separate to my work because I'm just looking at the resting state. But um, generally for the MDMA, I think they were in the scanner for 90 minutes. I think the psilocybin, they're in the scanner for about the same length of time, about an hour maybe. Um, and they did some f tests afterwards and then there's follow-ups as well, like a week later and a few days later. So there's quite a lot of stuff involved in these protocols that isn't particularly relevant to, to this. My research is particularly focused on this resting state stuff. But I think Robin, again, will probably talk about more of this on Sunday. Okay, and there were PET scans as well. Um, we haven't done any PET scans, no. PET scans are very expensive compared to fMRI, so. Look, I had just one more quick question about the um, hallucinogen experience of the people who went through your study. Was there a large range? Were they mostly experienced or naive to the they're, they're all very experienced. I think the average psilocybin use was 16 times, but a very high standard deviation, so people were, you know, 30 or 40 experiences. That's part of the ethical approval was only using people who had... Uh, had experiences and not had a difficult time before. So. Okay, that's it uh, for Luke. Thank you very much. Um, I'm